If you're a contractor or manufacturer in Florida, or you're thinking about doing work in Florida, it's important to understand the differences and uniqueness of the Florida Building Code. That's what we're talking about in today's Q&A Monday. What's up guys, welcome to Q&A Mondays and welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel, I'm Thad Barnett. Subscribe if you're new, we release metal roofing and metal construction content every Monday and Wednesday. Today we are talking about Florida Building Code, how it's different, what its requirements are, and what you need to know as a contractor doing work in Florida. Today I have the Sheffield Metals Technical Director, Jeff Hawk, with me. All the questions that we're going to be discussing are in the description below. You can jump ahead using those quick links. All right, Jeff. So thanks for being here. If you're a contractor uh, in Florida or you're thinking about doing work in Florida, what are some things that you should know right off the bat when it comes to Florida Building Code? Well, I guess the, the it's probably the main thing you should know is what the engineering requirements for the area that you're going to be looking for. Florida, you know, it's basically broken into three different parts as far, you know, as far as different uh, requirements. You have Miami-Dade County NOAs, which is basically their own animal. Uh, then you have Florida Building Code, which is separated into uh, non-high velocity hurricane zones and then high velocity hurricane zones. So it's important to know which area you're going to be working in to figure out what kind of engineering you're going to be, is going to be required of you to have. So whether you're here or you're looking at coming here, it's important to Find out from the manufacturer who you're dealing with, what they have to offer as far as the engineering, the uh, the profiles that have the proper engineering on them that, that you're going to need. You don't want to be buying a brand new machine and, you know, find out later that you don't have the roller kits uh, that, that, you know, you're going to need. So basically everything all comes down to the engineering, uh, finding out what engineering is going to be required of you and making sure that you have that appropriate testing to be able to meet the requirements in the area that you're working in. Awesome. So let's dive into some of the specifics about a few of the things you were talking about. Tell me a little bit about the differences between Florida Building Code and, and Miami-Dade. Tell me about that. So Miami-Dade has its own set of rules. Uh, a lot of the testing is the same. The main difference between Miami-Dade's testing that you have to have and the Florida Building Code for high-velocity hurricane zones is Miami-Dade requires impact testing, so ASTM E1886. It's a large missile impact testing. Basically, they shoot out a two by four at the roof. It's for windborne debris. Um, obviously, that's a big concern in a hurricane. Seven things flying through the air that shouldn't be. From the testing standpoint between HVHZ and non-HVHZ is HVHZ basically, uh, we'll see, let's start with non-HVHZ. Non-HVHZ, you have to have a UL 580 uplift test. That's pretty much it. You know, you got to make sure that it meets the minimum requirements to stay on the roof. For HVHZ, you do three UL580 uplift tests. You do two fields, which is your further clip spacing, and then you do a corner test, which is your closest clip spacing. A lot of times in the high-velocity hurricane zone areas, your roof is going to be broken out into perimeters. So you'll have your corner zones, your perimeter zones, and then your field zones. And that'll be, you know, what those spacings are going to be is going to be based on the testing that you have and the, uh, the design of your roof. So basically, you have the three UL580 uplift tests, and then you also have what's called TAS100 testing, which is wind-driven rain. Uh, that test, they have a big prop airplane engine, and it shoots water, and it simulates 8.8 .8 inches of rainfall an hour of wind speeds up to 110 miles an hour. Non-HVHZ in Florida, UL580 test, uplift test, you're good to go. HVHZ in Florida, three UL580 uplift tests, TAS100 wind-driven rain test. Miami-Dade in Florida, all three of those tests for the HVHZ plus uh, impact testing, 1886, ASTB 1886. It's kind of good, better, best in terms of uh, the testing standards that are going to be required. Definitely. And for those of you that's been uh, following the channel, we've mentioned Miami-Dade a few times. And one of the times that you can hear us talk about that is in our Cayman Islands video. Check out the link in the description for that. Um, Jeff, the Cayman Islands... Uh, after Hurricane Ivan hit in 2004, they started adopting some Miami-Dade principles and really started using it as a basis of design. Can you tell me why someone would want to do that or, or, or why, you know, kind of what their thinking would be behind, you know, choosing Miami-Dade as a basis of design? Well, as of right now, uh, Miami-Dade has the most stringent engineering requirements of any code 
enforcement uh, approval certification body that there is. So if basically if you're specifying a, a Miami-Dade NOA, you know that they've done pretty much every test that you could think of that would be applicable to your roof system. Again, just because you have a Miami-Dade NOA or a FBC approval number, things like that, you still need to make sure that the uplift pressure, the test pressure uh, or design pressure is going to meet the needs in the environment that you're in. I can have a test report that says I have, you know, a negative 106 design pressure. And that's a good design pressure, but is it good enough for the area that you're looking at installing in? You can still have the certification or approval, but that doesn't always mean that it's going to meet your uplift requirements. The wind driven rain, the impact testing, things like that, that's all pass or fail. But the variables come in when it comes to the uplifts and the design pressures that the panels actually reach. And I assume that if we look at this from the opposite end of the spectrum as well, if we're a contractor that's used to the stringent requirements of Miami-Dade, if we wanted to do work you know, outside of Florida, we could pretty much handle anything if we're, if we're used to that, if, if it's the most stringent. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, when it comes down to having, you know, the, the three uplift tests that we talked about, you have your corner spacing and you have your field spacing. So, you know, with those with those types of numbers, you can pretty much meet whatever you have to. So say you have a two foot clip spacing and a six inch clip spacing. You know, those are the two, two spacings you tested at. Uh, you have a design calculations done on your building. With, with having the 24 and the six inch spacing, they can interpolate the numbers, um, basically figuring out how it would perform at 12 inches and 18 inches. So you might not have to put your clips at six inches on center because that would be too much. You might be able to get away with 12 inches on center because that's the design pressure you would need to meet. Sure. But having, having those uh, numbers spaced out, you're able to determine how it's gonna perform you know, at different spacings in between. So what does this mean when I'm talking to a manufacturer and I need to order coil, accessories? Uh, what should that conversation be and how would this affect that? Again, you're going to have to check what the spec is calling for to make sure that you can meet the specifications of the, of the spec. You're going to have to make sure that the system that you're purchasing, whether it's you know, you're going to be buying pre-made panels or you're going to roll them yourself and you're using the engineering that's you know, provided with the coil from the manufacturer you're purchasing from, you want to make sure that their engineering is going to meet the requirements of the job. But when it comes down to actual parts and pieces, you want to make sure that, you know, the gauge of the material is what was tested. Your panel width can't be any wider than the panel that was tested. So if you tested a 16 inch panel, you can't use an 18 inch panel. You need to make sure that the screws that you have or the screws that were used in the test. You need to make sure the clips you have or the clips that were used in the test. And, you know, if there's any accessory items as far as, having to have sealing in the seams or things like that. Uh, you, you know, it, basically everything has to be installed per that test report. So you wanna make sure that the items you're getting are matching that test report. Now, is there a difference between commercial projects and residential product projects when it comes to Florida building code and requirements like that? Uh, to my knowledge, if you pull a permit, you have to meet Florida building code. So you're gonna to have to have something, you know, saying that, you know, you can meet the requirements for the area that you're pulling the permit in. Quite honestly, not only if you install it for Florida building code and you use the proper engineering in that area, you know, it really protects not only the homeowner, obviously they know they're getting a system that's correct for the area that they're in, but it protects the contractor as well because he has something to back up the installation that he did. You know, this test report says that if I put my clips here and I use these fasteners with this width panel, that that's how it's going to perform. So it's not, again, as we talked about in the testing video we did down at the lab, there's no guessing. We know how it should perform. You know, all these five UL580 uplift tests have a 50% safety factor built into them. So there's quite a bit of error that you can have and the roof should still perform the way, the way it was tested. You mentioned something earlier about panel profiles. Talk to me about uh, choosing the right panel profile for the area. Not all panel profiles are made equal. They're just not. Certain pan profiles are going to perform better under testing, uplift testing than others. They all perform pretty well under the wind driven rain testing or 1646 water penetration testing. You know, snap locks, you know, there's a test called ASTM E2140. It's a submersion test uh, where they basically submerge the panel under six inches of water. I don't know of any snap lock panels are gonna, that are going to pass that test. So, you know, slope comes into play as far as which panel you're going to pick. But again, it comes down to 
the panel and how it was tested and what the design pressures it got. Um, certain panels are definitely stronger than others. You know, if you look, you compare the inch and a half snap lock, 450 compared to the inch and three quarter snap lock, just the panel design itself is going to lead to the inch and three quarter panel being stronger when it comes to uplift resistance. It has a continuous lock going all the way down the panel, plus you have the clip that's holding it to the deck. The 450 snap lock panel actually snaps onto the clip. So you're, the strength of that panel is completely determined by clip spacing as far as the attachment of the actual snap engaging goes. So the pa different panel profiles are going to perform differently under different tests or under the same test standards. It's, again, based on profile of the panel, um, gauge has a lot to do with it. That's why I say, especially if you're looking at purchasing a machine or something like that, you really want to make sure that the panel profiles you're looking at getting with the machine are going to meet the engineering requirements for your area. That has to be one of the main considerations when you look into buying a machine. Because if you end up buying panel profiles that don't meet any of the requirements, then you're just out a lot of money for, for nothing, basically. Correct. And, you know, it's, uh, it's always easier to do it right the first time. <laughs> than it is to try to go back and do it a second time. Manufacturers are there for that reason. You know, if you were able to call us up, you know, we'd tell you what engineering we have on certain profiles. You could see it right on our website. You know, we have it between engineered and non-engineered systems. Um, it's always good if you have any questions, talk to the manufacturer and then they can help steer you in the right direction. Because if you can't provide the engineering, you can't get the project that doesn't do us any good as a supplier and it doesn't do you any good as a contractor slash installer. Yeah, tell me more about the importance of having a good relationship with your manufacturer as a contractor, especially in an area like Florida. I think it just makes everything easier, quite honestly. If you have somebody that you trust, that you know is uh, going to give you the information you need, or if they, they don't know it, they're going to be able to go out and find the information for you. Not only does that save a contractor a lot of time, but it should give some peace of mind that the manufacturer has the contractor's best interest. Because, you know, we want you to succeed. If you succeed, we succeed. It's a, it's a team effort. Being available, communication, you know, I talk about all the time with the weather type warranties, communication is key. The more communication you have with your manufacturer, the safer you should be, especially when you're bidding projects that are going to require the, the different engineering. And especially if you're not used to, uh, you know, dealing with those type of projects. If you're a contractor who's not in Florida, how can you apply these same principles to your work to make sure that you're staying within the pro appropriate building code, you are following the correct engineering. Tell me about you know, how, how we can do that. Well, when it comes down to residential work, you're not gonna have a specification or something like that as far as a guideline, but you do have building code. So it's important to know what the code says. You should read up on that. Um, you know, certain states require contractors license, you know, to be licensed. And obviously those people are gonna be more familiar because they've had a pass a written test and things like that than say, somebody, some states where they work where you don't require a license, but, you know, knowing what the requirement is for your building, building code in your area, you know, is, is very important and it's pretty easy to find. So definitely check that out too. When it comes to metal roofing, um, you know, we, we basically consider UL 90 as the, as the bare bones minimum when it comes to engineering standards. Uh, you know, we have a weather type warranty and there's no performance requirements on it. We install it, you know, to a minimum of UL 90, 90, 99.9% .9 of the times it's more, but uh, minimum UL 90. And again, that keeps you safe as a contractor or installer because you have something to back up how you installed it. You have a piece of paper with an engineer's seal on it or a construction number that says, if I put my clips here and I use this type of panel and I use these type of screws, that it's a minimum UL 90. And that to me is basically industry standard. Yeah. And it's not just, I've been doing this you know, forever this way, you have actual data to back it up. Exactly. You know, and that should have the building owner feel more comfortable. It should have you as a contractor be more comfortable because again, like I said, you know, you have someone to say, you know, this is, this is installed for this information. And again, you know, the manufacturer should be able to help get you that information and be able to point you in the right direction. And more importantly, a manufacturer should be able to say, Hey, you really don't want to go that route. You know, you want to be able to have those open lines of communication where if they see something that's a big red flag, you got to be able to say that. And that's not always comfortable doing it with the customer. But again, the idea is that the manufacturer should have your best interest in mind and your company's best interest in mind. So sometimes you got to have harder conversations and tell people things they might not like to hear, but, you know, it's in their best interest. 
So besides engineering requirements, are there anything else that you have to follow to be able to use that type of engineering in Florida? Uh, probably the biggest one it comes down to is a quality assurance program. Uh, it's a third party QA program. Uh, as far as I know, the biggest name that does it in Florida is Keystone Certifications. Basically, when you go out and you do a project that's requiring FBC approvals and things like that, you keep a job information sheet, you keep a panel sample, and then the QA, or the third party QA, again, it's, it's not the manufacturer's uh, personnel or employees, it's a third party. They come out and they do an audit once a year to make sure that you're running panels in tolerance, that your machine's producing good panels, that you're keeping the proper records and things like that. Well, thanks, Jeff. I think we learned a lot about Florida Building Code. Make sure that you understand your local area and that you're talking with your manufacturer and you're following the right requirements for your installations. As always, I'm Thad Barnett. Make sure you subscribe here to the Metal Roofing Channel. Comment down below. We'll catch you next time.